five years ago, around 4,000 people from Britain and Ireland left their home to fight against fascists in Spanish Civil War. A fight that seemed to right for many people, teenagers or elders, a fight that gathered the world in Spain under the name of International Brigaders. There are only three British brigaders left alive and a few others around the world. Even if they do not trust their memory anymore, an experience of Spanish TV war cannot be forgotten easily. For many of them, fighting against fascists was the best thing of their lives. I didn't know anything about Spain, nothing. I didn't know what they were fighting about, anything. All I knew was there were many wounded and they needed help. And I think this was the attitude of most of the international brigades. They were there to fight fascism, and that's what they were there for. Inspired by the true story of the surviving international brigaders, composer Karl Lukovic created Goodbye Barcelona, a passionate musical about a British mother and son caught up in the Spanish Civil War. Goodbye Barcelona, at the end they leave Barcelona, they've lost. Goodbye Barcelona, but still in a way triumphant. And um, I'd seen this article, this was about the surviving members of the international brigades. And it had interviews with, uh, with the people remembering, we interviewed him, that's Lou Kenton. Sam Russell, and uh, I looked at this and I thought, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Um, these people are in the 90s, and when they were in their 20s or earlier, in the teenagers, they decided to go and make a stand against fascism. It, it, it's sad and happy at the same time. They lost the war, but in a way they won because they made they made a stand that will last forever in a way, their, their example. against fascism for most of the British brigaders started when Sir Ozil Mosley planned a provocative march in East End of London on 4th of October 1936. On that day, the Jewish Chronicle warned Jews to keep away from the route of Black Shirt March and from their meetings. But nobody kept away. Shouting the Spanish Civil War slogan, No Pasaran, they shall not pass. More than 3,000 people from all over the country turned back an army of black shirts. From impartial people, the police are nothing but praise. So does Sir Philip Game in banning the march. Firm action by the commissioner and his men undoubtedly averted bloodshed on a scale more terrible than London has ever witnessed. I actually chose the east end of London because it was mainly a Jewish area that he went to and he was... Um, but this actually is, um, all this uh, uh, aroused a lot of opposition from all types of people, from liberals, 
through, through right through to the Communist Party. And um, the, the opposition to him was, it was actually enormous. And it was because of this opposition to fascism being shown by the, the people of, of England, Britain, that I felt I had to take it further. I felt I had to fight fascism all over the world. When the, uh, the, this, the, the, the fight in Spain had started just before this march, um, we... Uh, the, the International Brigade had started, formed a group, and I felt this is the, the only way I could sh show my feelings and show, you know, do something. Would you be willing to sacrifice everything? How can you leave when it's time to go? Everyone tells you to stay. Why should you go if there's so much to lose? Can you dare to ignore what they say in the news? But you still hear the sound you can't seem to refuse. No, no, no pass on them, no, no, no pass on them. How would you feel when the... For 23 years old, Thomas Waters, political reasons for volunteering didn't exist. He left his work and went to Spain as an ambulance driver. In 1936, there was a big appeal in the periodicals, in the newspapers, asking for volunteers to go to Spain. Well, in Mediatamente, this was what I had been training for, and I volunteered. So eventually, after interviews, we went off. They decided to send an ambulance unit. And we went off from, from uh, Glasgow, six, uh, six ambulances and one furgon. And we had to go all the way from Glasgow to Madrid. And we had to go the long way because the way the lines of between the two forces were made, we had to go the long way, which meant driving right down through France, Toulouse and Carcassonne, Perpignan, and into España, and the Barcelona, Tarragona, Valencia, and Tontes, Madrid. There was a, um, a weekend ticket for a very, very cheap rate. Um, from London, by train from London to um, uh, Portsmouth, mm -hmm. and from Portsmouth by ferry to France, and by by train to Paris. And in Paris, um, we were a small group of people gathered together to go on from there over to Spain. So from Paris. Um, we were put on a coach to travel as far as the Pyrenees and from the Pyrenees we were uh, we were a group of, of people also added to the party uh, not all the uh, English people there's a, probably about five or two eight uh, from England and the rest were from France and from Germany
were met there um, by a couple of um, Sp uh, Spanish guys who led us over the Pyrenees. So at night, at night time, when we got there and picked up by the by the uh, guides, we went as far as the, the, the bottom of the Pyrenees, and the, uh, there were the uh, French custom there. And as we approached them, they turned around the other way and looked the other way. And anyhow, we it took us the whole night. It was a, quite a climb over the Pyrenees. And the following morning, we reached Spain, the foot of the Pyrenees. We were met there by a, by, by a truck, and we all gathered about, probably about 12, 14 of us were in the truck, and we were driven to Figueres. And from Figueres, there was other people who had gathered there. So until there was a, a certain amount of people, we were then taken by road as far as the, uh, the camp. There were some, some in the International Brigade who had fought in the in the, in the war, in the, yeah, in the First World War. Anyhow, this we you know we got together and we we trained for a few weeks. I was on uh, um, training to use a, a heavy Maxim, which was a, a, a Russian machine gun. Very soon, when we arrived there, we asked the authorities for an interpreter, and we were. A young man called Joaquin Usayan, he came to us and he could speak good English. The problem was he had to learn how to speak Scottish English because it's different. But he did very, very well. And he was with us all the time, all the time, yeah. And when I was of the the transporte, and we had to have several conductors always for moving people and things from uh, Madrid down to Valencia or Alicante. And he used to type out the asking permission for a servo, good, servo conducto, and I had to sign it on then. And with that then, you could go to the committee and get so many coupons to gasolina. And at that time, we were involved in picking up a lot of the International Brigade people, British and Scottish, all this, a lot of those then at that time, yeah. A lot of, many of them had been brought up from Albacete and they had very little training and they were pushed onto trucks and put right up and they were wounded straight away, some of them. Very, very bad. Having fought um, a, quite a few skirmishes in and around, uh, you know, the front, um, after a, a couple of months, I was taken prisoner. And I don't know how, because there was a skirmish that we were fighting the night before, and uh, it was it was quite a heavy skirmish. And I don't remember anything. But being I was uh, the following morning, I was laying on the ground, face down on the ground, and with the uh, Italian troops. Italian and Morse, and I don't know how I got there.
David Lemon was captured with other members of the British battalion during fighting in Aragon in the spring of 38 and spent six months in the notorious prison camp of San Pedro de Cardenas near Burgos. They took a list of all our names and every fourth name they, they've called out, which included me, to be exchanged with, uh, for Spanish prisoner of war that was in France. And then we had the fighting in the streets of Madrid. And this was towards the end of 1936. Now, as you know, Madrid is in the middle of the peninsula, very high up, 2,000 feet up. And in August, it's ati mucho calor. And they're very uncomfortable. But in the winter, you get snow and ice, and very, very cold. And the Madrileños were having a very, very bad time. There were very little food because the transport was only coming up with reinforcements and things for the army, and very, very little for the Madrileños. At the end of 1936, back to Glasgow. And we didn't know if that was the end. But after a week or two, they said, no, we were going to reorganize with more members and some more vehicles. Well, we had to get two new ambulances because one had been captured in the fighting in the streets and my one was destroyed with bombs. So we got two new ones. We also got a small car and then we got two big trucks and we they were loaded up with food and all sorts of things and we had to go the long journey again back to Madrid. And we started then, where it was quiet, we were able to try to help some of the worst cases of the civilians in Madrid. And the Sanidad Militar, they knew this well and they helped us when they could to let us do this work. And they try to concentrate on heavily pregnant women and see them through their pregnancy and also women with big, small families and give them just basic food, some bis cheese and biscuits and some dried fish, things like that, you see. And so it went on. So our work was spreading between the army and the civilians to a small degree. There used to be a tremendous comparison when you left Spain and went into France and a place full of food and everything. Oh, it was terrific. Whereas in Spain, it was very difficult to get food at times. Yeah, very, very difficult. When the Spanish Civil War finished, most of the surviving brigaders were already home. But here, their experience was not an act of bravery. They faced the government prejudices and they had to forget all the horrors they've seen. Franco was in power for all those years and um, the people didn't want to churn up all those memories. There was a sort of pact of forgetting. Um, and now people are really starting to remember. There's a lot of stuff coming out in Spain, as you know. And um, in this country, we, uh, people don't necessarily know about these guys and the, ter you know, the amazing bravery of these people their sort of passionate commitment to the cause, and that's quite unusual. If we just look at the British ones, effectively what they were doing was showing up the cowardice of the British government. They were underlining the fact that the British government was putting its class prejudices, if you like, before its strategic interests. We even have the case of, of Winston Churchill, who at the beginning of the Spanish Civil War 
was saying things like, I am an aristocrat. If I was Spanish, by now my family and myself would have been massacred. And by the end of the Spanish Civil War, was saying, we have to support the Democratic Republic because if we don't, it, what is happening in Spain will be the first step towards a fascist takeover of the world. And in fact, what took <coughs> Churchill two and a half years to realise, the international brigaders had realised in the first couple of days. And they went because they knew that if fascism was not stopped in Spain, it would very soon, the, the same bombers and fighters that were bombing Madrid and Barcelona and Valencia and Bilbao and Guernica, of course, would very soon be doing the same in Paris and London. And we know they were right. And for that reason alone, I mean, I think anything that we do to celebrate the astonishing courage of these men who went to fight for this, with no, not the slightest hope of gain, and they were excoriated as, as communist trash. Many of them were not communists. They went in order to fight for democracy. They understood all too well the threat posed by the spread of fascist ideologies across Europe. And despite the legacy of World War I, which had tinged much of the left with a strong pacifist streak, experience gained fighting Mosley's black shirts in Aberdeen, in Manchester, in London and beyond, had led these determined anti-fascists to conclude reluctantly that there was no other way. Liverpool docker and trade unionist Jack Jones. The awful realisation that black fascism was on the march right across Europe created a strong desire to act. I'm in constant admiration of them for a start because I'm thinking to myself, would I have done that? Would I have the courage? Because a lot of them went out to fight fascism, but because they were so badly equipped, because what happened was, as you know, there was a thing called the non-intervention policy where the British and the French, mainly, who could have easily helped, decided they would not sell arms to Spain. So they were tacitly um, complicit in, in allowing fascism to grow. During the war there, I, tr I tried just to take some, a few photographs of people and places, nothing about the war, because I was writing to my elder sister always, and I didn't want her to get worried about it. And they, I didn't take anything about the war. Some people often said, uh, wasn't it terrible seeing the terrible things? But I said, well, it's the onlooker who sees the horror. When something terrible happened, it was our job to get going doing something. What do you do? What's the first thing you do? Well, this, 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 this. And the horror of it doesn't strike you. Someone's just looking at it, sees it. But uh, one of the worst things I suppose I saw was uh, in the street fighting in Madrid and they had one of these uh, coming down from Carabanchel, down the road that takes you around to the Puente de Toledo mm -hmm. and the, the nationalists wanted to come down here and they had these barricades like that every so often, you see. And we had, uh, we went up there to the last one always and we waited there for wounded and we were coming back again when an officer stopped us. I had the commandante with me and he said, you've just lost one of your ambulances. Lost it? Yes. He said, it went right past the last barricade and the guards didn't realise it. And they only realise it when they get there, and the nationalists. And they said the worst thing is they've shot them. The main thing I learned was the value of things, a better sense of values, to appreciate what you've got when you've got it. I was, I was seen throughout the world. I'd already seen um, what the, the, the right wing could do to people. And then was all this problem with Russia. I could see that the same thing was happening to the far left or was happening to the far right. 
and that the people, you know, were not getting the best of, 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 of either of them. The international brigaders who fought in Spain started their fight against fascists before many governments had realised its threat. Even if they couldn't defeat Franco, their lesson can have a page in history. Britain is celebrating them.